Cormac McCarthy was a huge fan of Ernest Hemingway, and there is so much talk in the McCarthy community about McCarthy's imitation of William Faulkner, but there has been very little discussion of McCarthy and Hemingway, and I absolutely love Ernest Hemingway. For years, I focused on him in academia, but today we are bringing them together with some straight fire. And before we get to stuff that is in the archive, we first need to talk about the masculinity principles at play. Hemingway is as hyper-masculine as you can get for being kind of a sentimental type. And Hemingway's masculinity stemmed from feeling emasculated by his mother because his mother forced him to dress as a woman and called him Ernie until the age of eight in the farmland community outside of Chicago. And he got bullied, obviously, and that made him feel very insecure about his identity as a man. And to make that even worse, he couldn't get into World War I and joined in the, the Italian um, ambulance corps or with the, red, with the Red Cross and was working in Italy and he got wounded. And he felt emasculated by that because he had to tell everyone, yeah, I just got wounded from a random bomb as an ambulance driver. And so that's why obviously for the rest of his life, he really embodied these hyper-masculine principles. And McCarthy does something very similar. With his lifestyle, he doesn't like to talk to all those soft writers. He doesn't like all the liberals in Santa Fe. He plays pool. He rides horses, plays golf, has dogs, has had multiple wives. You guys get the picture. And so now tightening our literary focus a little bit more, let's talk about the father-son relationship with McCarthy and with Hemingway. Obviously, the inception of the road happened when McCarthy was in a hotel room watching his son sleep, and that like kind of sparked the road. And kind of one of the themes of the novel is that the father has to go on before the son. The father has to die, and it's very tragic, and the son moves on. But this is a very big part of the Nick Adams stories, which are, I th- in my opinion, the best works by Hemingway, not just on a literary level, but just on terms of there is a literary analysis gold mine there in terms of like trauma. I had a professor, this will blow your guys' mind, that we would spend three to six hours on one Hemingway short story. And like he'd be examining it word by word and had the craziest theories about what was going on. And that actually really showed me how deep literary criticism can go. There's always some fucking asshole in the comments like, it's all just in the book. What are you guys doing? This is just over over intellectualization of all this. And I'm like, no. Have you ever talked about a book with some of your friends or a movie and what you thought? This is just the highest degree degree of it. A bunch of random people talking about what they think happened in the book is great. But there are levels to that. The father preparing the son is also very apparent at the end of No Country for Old Men, where he is, where the father is clearing a path for the son. He's laying down codes and rituals for the various journeys that the son is going to have to go through. And one of the easiest conceptions of this, for some of you guys, if you haven't read Hemingway or short stories, go read Indian Camp. It's really short. And in the story, though, the son and the father go to this Indian camp where a woman is giving birth and she's having trouble. And the father, who is a doctor, helps him, helps the woman out. But while this is going on, obviously the birth is very brutal. The father, I think, of the the birth child commits suicide and it's very traumatic. And with Hemingway's minimalist writing, there's like a ton ton of analysis there. But at some level, the father is paving the way for his son to this very cruel world. In keeping with the idea of Indian camp in the road, there is that scene. It's kind of like a vicious, you know, one where the, uh, the wife of the father and the son leaves. And when you talk about this and I hear about people talking about this, because, you know, I love talking about McCarthy. Everyone's just kind of like, she's a coward, she's weak. But one interpretation is that she is clearing the way for the paternal bond to form. And this becomes apparent because it's like it's like the conundrum with single mothers. If you date a single mother, you're always going to be number two. And during this apocalypse, the the, the father's son is the number one. And this is exemplified because when the woman is giving birth during all of this, the father's quote... Uh, Quote, the wife's cries meant nothing to him. He didn't care that his wife was suffering. He just cared about delivering the baby and taking care of his son. That's all that mattered to him. He even gets to the level of saying, I was appointed by God to protect you in the novel. This is a very similar trope in Indian camp. The baby has been breached. That means the 
feet are coming out first. And the father works without distraction for days, if I remember correctly. And he detaches himself from the suicide and from any of the other going ons around him. So and, and her own pain so that he can deliver the baby. Another theme that both men use heavily is that women are spiritual guides to broken men. We see the rapture of John Grady Cole. We see Sheriff Bell's daughter, um, who I think is now dead, act as a spiritual guide. He like speaks to her in the novel. In the road, the father um, is having these visions back to the mother, and even though they may seem negative, they are somewhat of a driving force. Keeping her memory, uh, uh, keeping her alive is done by keeping the boy alive. And then obviously most recently in The Passenger, uh, Bobby really, Alicia really serves as a spiritual medium for Bobby at a lot of levels. And then ob- then also women that are the main spiritual guides of the kind of trippy scenes in McCarthy's works. And so when we look at like stylistically, McCarthy obviously doesn't mimic or have anything, you know, or take M- M- Hemingway's kind of short minimalist prose at all. Instead, he... As Brad Duffy says, excuse me, Brad McDuffie says, quote, McCarthy alchemizes the core principles of Nick Adams' pilgrimage through life and the various lessons he learns along the way. And McDuffie also talks about in his novels that McCarthy and Hemingway both like to make a character with a code. And that code is not the classic Achillean code to go be the greatest of all time, but one of personal integrity and honor. And obviously we see this very much so in the border trilogy. We have John Grady Cole, who does a bunch of honor, uh, you know, saving on honor theft at the end of the novel to get Rollins and Blevins' horses back in the crossing. The whole novel is driven by this code hero, code hero Billy Parham, knows that the world is screwed up, so he has to return the wolf, and then eventually he has to go get his horses back and then go get Boyd's bones back. Like it never ends. Bobby Wester and the passenger has a code. Sutri, even though it may, that makes me laugh, has a code. A lot of these characters are code-driven. They aren't this, an, these ambitious beings. And that is, a, you know, Hemingway was very famous for doing that. And once again, that's a part of being a man. McCarthy seems to be a man with a code. He doesn't talk about his works. He likes to act in a certain way. He, you probably don't bring certain things up with him. And that's, that's classic. A lot of men aren't like that anymore. What are the father and son doing in the road other than living by a code the easiest thing to do if you have a gun and you have bullets is to go kill people and become a cannibal obviously they're making it a lot harder on themselves by not by doing that by not doing that they quote they the, both of them quote live by a code that seems to transcend time and place and the fire they carry was once carried by those who abided in this code before Returning to Indian camp, both son and father are living by a code. And one of those codes is you don't express your emotions too much. You don't have too much interiority. In the whole Nick Adams stories, we're dealing, it's very autobiographical to Hemingway's trauma. It's one of the greatest trauma narrations of of all time. And it's really a field guide on how to deal with trauma. But we never really get inside Nick Adams' head. And we never get into the characters' heads, really, of any McCarthy novels. They both reject the in- interiority Proustian, you know, mess that, you know, I absolutely love, but really isn't how Americans function. You know, let's just be honest. That's some European bullshit. Over here in America, we escaped all that nuance and learned to almost live in the moment again because of the vast expansiveness of the land. I can get in my forerunner right now and head out on a desert road and not see anybody or any buildings or really anything for hours. I could just drive for hours and not see anything and just go through valley after valley. And that's just one small section of one small state in the United States. You know, that necessarily isn't as available of as an experience in Europe. And one in one of my favorite uh, Hemingway stories, Big Two Hearted River, there's this big analogy at the at the end that he had been hooked by God that like he had found God again. And this is kind of one of the big themes in uh, the old man and the sea. And this is, and William Faulkner called the old man and the sea Hemingway's best novel because it, he had Hemingway had found God again, according to Faulkner. And maybe he hadn't read big two hearted river, but that's what he was trying to say. Oh, it's a big one. This fish. Oh, by God, this is a big one that, Nick Adams in this journey had refound this connection with God. And this is very similar to the climactic end moments of The Road, where McCarthy is dealing with uh, metaphors involving a fish and the word of God. 
as the boy's father is dying. And Olivia Carr Edenfield, who wrote an essay on McCarthy and Hemingway that inspired this presentation, says that the code, the rituals, God, hospitality, the questions and the answers seem to be the same for both writers. And that hum of mystery is a steady reassurance that light will follow darkness. And so how do you guys think that Hemingway inspired McCarthy? There is only one reference to McCarthy and uh, that McCarthy makes to Hemingway, and that is in Whales and Men. And McCarthy says, quote, Hemingway said that hawks don't share. But of course hawks share. It's rabbits that don't share. And to take this even deeper, Hemingway, in when he was talking about hawks not sharing, was actually making a metaphor to Zelda Fitzgerald, F. Scott Fitzgerald's wife. And apparently Hemingway is insinuating that this lady was insane, that, quote, Scott did not write anything anymore that was good until after he knew that she was ins insane. So hawks do share, but I don't know how the hell we know that anyway. 